Good morning, church. Good morning, church. It feels good to be back in the house of the Lord on this good old Sunday. If there was church every day of the week, how many of us would be there? <laughs> he said, I know I would. Amen. This song says, as we stand and open up and usher in the presence of God, the song says, we have come into this house. I say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Let's pray as we seek the Lord's uh, presence. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you for your, your loving kindness, Lord. We thank you for watching over us and for taking care of us and for bringing us back into the house of the Lord. We thank you for your presence here already, and we pray that you will continue to warm the atmosphere with your presence. We thank you, Lord, to be able to come again together as a body of believers to encourage each other to strengthen each other to learn from each other and then get a word from you we pray that you would challenge us this morning confront us this morning encourage us and strengthen us lord give us give us the hope and the tolerance and the endurance that we need lord solidify and strengthen our faith in you and our hope in you but Lord, we pray that you would just bless us with your presence today that's what we need we need you lord And we pray that you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Uh, I'm reminded of what the psalm writer said this morning, and it's a little bit uh, personal to me this morning. I was glad when they said, not to y'all, Mother Bingham, I'm glad he said it to me. <laughs> Let us go into the house of the Lord. My feet are standing in a good place, and it's good to be back here. I miss you all. Well, we missed you all, my wife and I. 
I will say though that Miles has gotten a little older. <laughs> <laughs> and lost his head like me. Good to see you, Doc. <laughs> thank God, thank God, thank God. At this time, we'll have uh, announcements coming from uh, Pastor Bishop. Uh, Let's see. And we do want to say uh, it's really, really, truly, truly good to see Brother Bertrand, Elder Bertrand and his wife, Alicia, here this morning. We thank God so much for their presence. And I hope that all of us know by now they've moved, uh, what, it's a couple of hours of driving time, well, kind of in the... Uh, uh, Palm Springs, uh, Palm Springs area. Everybody's not able, but uh, we're, we're glad the Lord's blessed y'all. Amen. 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 <laughs> yes. It's cheaper. Oh, okay. Okay. Extremely. okay. We also have uh, as guests this morning uh, James and Anna uh, Ferguson, um, brother to uh, Brother Ferguson. Uh, we are thankful for your presence this morning. And, uh, thanks the Lord for you. And also today, uh, Maddie Walker. Maddie Walker, we uh, okay, thank you, man. Good to, uh, okay, also a guest of uh, Brother Ferguson. Okay, thank you. We're delighted to have all of you. Remember this evening, or uh, not this evening, this evening there will be, I suppose, the UCWM uh, prayer call is tonight. Yes. The UCWM prayer call will be this evening, and those ladies who tune into that know how to do that and how that information is on the uh, National Church announcements. Tomorrow evening, on Monday evening at 6 p.m., there is the National Prayer Call, and we invite you to tune into that at 6 p.m. on tomorrow evening. Please remember our sick and shut-in. Uh, I have been in contact with most of them this uh, this week, and most are faring okay, but certainly <clears throat> would appreciate a phone call or a prayer, your prayers, or a card from you. We know that we're very limited in terms of visiting people's houses these days, but it's still nice to reach out. I want to commend Sister Crew. Uh, if I think she has a whole group of people that she calls. I know she has a group of people that she calls every Wednesday. And uh, when I move around or when I talk to people via the phone, they let me know how much they appreciate it. Kim and Anthony, I see Anthony. Anthony, where is uh, uh, Kim? Is, are you by yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm by myself today. Well, well, it's good to see you, Anthony. Good to see you. Amen. Good to see you. Amen. Our praise team is now going to come and minister, after which we'll have the reading of Scripture. Amen. The song says, Yeah. 
church say amen. 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 Um, if you are physically able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? It's good to see my Aunt Anna and Uncle James and my cousin Maddie. Any other family in the house? <laughs> Y'all know my tribe, they're here. So, all right. Our scripture is coming from Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And it reads, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, per permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. 
May God add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and most of all, the doer of his holy word. You may take your seats.
church say amen amen how blessed we are to be in god's house in the presence of the god's people ministered to by such a great praise team and daniel we appreciate your ministry amen we exalt you we exalt you and that's what we want to do this morning through the ministry of god's word we want to exalt him and through his word amen amen let me invite your attention to mark chapter 10. mark chapter 10. the gospel according to mark chapter 10 you may be wondering about this particular passage but uh, we're going to try to work our way through it mark chapter 10. I shall begin reading at uh, verse 1. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again as he was accustomed, and he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? 
They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God hath joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The title of my message this morning is, It's Over Easy. Now, normally I use that expression when I'm asking Pearl to fry a couple of eggs. I'd like them over easy. But today I want to use that expression in relationship to the culture of divorce that exists within our country and also within the world in which we live. Whenever you talk about divorce, or whenever the minister talks about divorce, he needs much prayer. Because divorce is a very controversial issue in the church and outside the church. I um, learned this week that couples are more likely to divorce in their first or second years of marriage then around the fifth or through the eighth years of marriage, and then the very highest rate of divorce right now is among those who are 60 plus. People who have been together for a while, but are deciding to throw in the towel and go their separate ways. Typically, when I have heard this in the church, and maybe the problem was not with those who were preaching, but with my hearing. Sometimes I have learned that the problem is, is that the minister did not say what I thought he said, but it's what I interpret him to say, and so it was my hearing. I've typically heard, I thought growing up, that um, divorce was the unpardonable sin that if you were divorced, that's just about, it's about over for you and any type of ongoing relationship with the church. There were some churches that have held this, that to a certain standard. I'm not talking about necessarily within this circle, but not only could you not be in leadership, you couldn't even usher at the door. I was... Um, uh, we know that here on the West Coast, the divorce and remarriage are quite common. A few years ago, I was sitting at a board meeting at Wheaton College, and some of you know that I'm a board member of Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, a uh, small Christian college there. And we who are trustees, there are 20 of us who are trustees of the college, and we were being reminded that, that a trustee cannot serve on the board who has been divorced and remarried. Sitting next to me, there was a fellow pastor from, Los a from the Pasadena area. And uh, he said, if that is the case, Emory, he's kind of whispering in my ear. He says, Emory, if that's the case, there goes half of our congregation. <laughs> Divorce and remarriage. In today's world, many times it's over easy. Now, we have a bunch of reasons for getting divorced, and I just want to run through 10 of the most common reasons for uh, divorce. And we want to hear what we're saying, and then we want to hear what God is saying. And remember, um, the Word of God is not like my phone. This morning when I got up, I noticed that I needed to update my phone. 
and Pearl's phone needed to be updated. Matter of fact, there were a couple of updates, a 14 and a 15. So I took a few moments to update our phones. And 30 days from now, six months from now, there may be another update to my phone. Phones are continually updated. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. There is no update to God's word. Now, we're trying to twist it and make it fit where we are and what we want to uh, subscribe to. But the word of God, it is forever settled in the heavens. And heaven and earth, the Bible says, will pass way before one jot or one tittle of the word of God. So the word, if we are believed word of God, whether we were living in the days of Paul the apostle, whether we were living in the 16 or 17 or 1800s or 1900s or in 2021, we are still to be governed. My life is to be under the word of God. So put your seatbelt on the ride, may get a little rough this morning. <laughs> there are a number of reasons and rationales of advanced uh, for divorce. Some people, number one, my spouse isn't a Christian, or I wasn't a Christian when I got married. Well, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul had an answer to that. He says that if you are married to the unbeliever and the unbeliever is pleased to stay with you, you stay with him because perhaps by your witness, the life that you live, the unbeliever may be become a believer and you can be together as those who are servants of Christ, number one. Number two, we weren't married in the church. I'm not sure what that has to do with anything, whether or not you were married. It's not where the ceremony takes place. It's the fact that you exchange vows before Almighty God. I need to get out of this marriage, number three, for the sake of the kids. Well, if you are in danger physically, if you are being abused physically, yes, you need to separate yourself. But I'm not sure why you would need to get out of the marriage for the sake of the kids. As a matter of fact, truth be told, the children are the ones who are going to be the most traumatized by the fact that you choose to go your separate ways. Sometimes the children are suffering for years and years and years feeling that somehow that they are the cause of the divorce, and most of them continue to live in hope that some way mom and daddy will get back together. That's the truth. Number four, my, another reason for our, the divorce many times or sometimes, my spouse is a huge disappointment. I, will, I would never have married this person if I have known if I knew what I know now. Well, none of us know the full deal until we get married, right? Amen. And, and I, I, I deserve better than this. And the fact is, uh, some people say, uh, over the years, they haven't taken care of themselves. They've let themselves go. And it's amazing what time and calories do to most all of us. Um, marriage is sometimes hard. I'm sure that Pearl would tell you this morning that she's never, ever thought about divorce. Pearl is my wife for those who are visiting. She might tell you she thought about murder, but she never thought about divorce. <laughs> Marriage is sometimes hard. And I have already told her that, you know, that if she leaves, I'm going with her. So <laughs> marriage, but marriage is sometimes hard. Number five, we are no longer in love. And it is true that, uh, and some marriage ceremonies nowadays say that uh, we will, you know, cleave to each other as long as our love shall last. Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, because if you're talking about romantic feelings, romantic feelings will definitely 
decrease with time, or at least those intense kind of romantic feelings that we have when we're in dating and engaged, where we can't keep our hands off one another, that does tend to dissipate over time. Number six, which is so prevalent in today's world, I owe it to myself to be happy. God wouldn't want me to be unhappy. God is not primarily concerned with your happiness. He is concerned with your holiness. He is concerned with your eternal well-being. But your day-to-day -day happiness is not first and foremost on the mind of God. I owe it to myself to be happy, and God wouldn't want me to be unhappy. Well, number seven, we met, I married the wrong person. We, we were just too, too young and and, and this is just, just, it's not, just not the right person for me. I, I realize we've grown apart. The idea of having some soulmate out there somewhere is probably a bit of fantasy. But if you did start off on a foundation of sand, we need to ask God for grace to press on. My marriage number eight is a constant struggle. Better to struggle than disobey God. All my friends, number nine, all my friends say I should leave. Um, are your friends giving you barbershop, beauty shop advice? Are your friends giving you advice from the word of God? It's one thing to uh, hear what God has to say. It oftentimes is quite another to hear what people are saying in the street. My friends say, I shouldn't leave. It is true that sometimes that marriage that starts out as ideal can become an ordeal. And many of us begin to look for a new deal. God will forgive me, number 10. God will forgive me. It's true that God is a forgiving God. But does it erase the reality or the truth that the word says, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And disobedience has consequences. Consequences in my own psyche and heart, consequences in, my, in the children of that offspring. Uh, this, we just saw all kinds of of trouble many times in the lives of the children. So you've heard what our 10 common reasons for seeking a divorce. And we want to challenge what our thinking may be by the word of God. And one of the things I don't, I don't know if you do this, but one of the things I do that as I read God's word, I know that I can trust the word of God because I know that the creator knows what's best for me. And I want his blessing to be upon my life. And therefore, I try to go into the word of God humbly. Lord, speak to me, show me me. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus is with his disciples, and at this point in his ministry, he knows that the cross is before him, and he's doing all that he can to pour into the disciples. He continues to try to teach them, trying to get them rooted and grounded, because he knows that when he makes his ascension back to the heavens, that the ball is in their court, they have got to carry on. So he continues to pour into them, and if you remember what verse Verse 1 there says that the multitudes came to him and he taught them. Our Lord had a teaching ministry that was a very, very powerful and profound ministry. And it was a major aspect of his walking among men when he was on earth, continually teaching. And sometimes I got to say this this morning that some of us, we avoid 
any type of instruction from God's word? How am I going to live faithfully to the word or how am I going to live effectively if I don't know what the word of God says? I've got to have an understanding of God's word, which means I need to ask the question that the eunuch asked when he met Philip on the road. He says, how can I know unless someone show me? Somebody has got to teach me. I've got to sit under some teaching. I've got to speak uh, under some instruction so that I will know what God has for me to understand. The Pharisees took advantage of these moments when Jesus would have a great crowd and he's pouring into them. He's giving them instruction from the Father. So the Pharisees, these very religious um, uh, group, uh, they came to him and they point, they, they pose a question. But now they pose the question not because they want to know, but they want to set him up. They want to trap him. They want to trick him. Uh, they, they, are, they want to catch him. And somehow, maybe if they can catch him right, they can bring down the wrath of the Roman government upon him, and Rome will take care of this new teacher named Jesus, whom they see as their chief rival. And they also, they do want it to be over easy. There were two schools of thought at that particular time. One major rabbi who was a, we would call him a liberal, Helios taught that you could put your wife away for any reason. He based this on Deuteronomy chapter 24, which says that if a man marries a woman and if he finds in her any uncleanness or indecency, he has the right to give her a writing, a certificate of divorce, and he can send her on her way. Well, the people, men, they were driving a Mack truck through that because they were interpreting that in such a way that if the wife burned the toast or if the wife insulted his in-laws or if he found someone else who was prettier and he liked better, out comes the pen and there goes the writing of divorcement. See you later, sweetie. That's the way it was being abused, manipulated, and interpreted. The other rabbinic school of thought was a rabbi by the name of Shema. And Shema was a much more conservative. And he said divorce was only permissible for sexual immorality. So there was this continual debate between these two schools of thought. And um, in Matthew's account of this parallel passage, the Pharisees asked the question this way, according to Matthew, is it lawful for a man to put his wife away for any and every reason? Which pretty much sounds like, in some ways, no-fault divorce today. People get divorced today for any and every uh, reason. So they bring this question to Jesus, hoping to trap him, set him up, and see where he's going to fall, and then uh, take advantage of whatever he said, particularly if it did not go the way that they wanted it to go. As they were wanting to talk about divorce, Jesus asked them the question, well, what did Moses say? Being the father who brought the Ten Commandments, the father of one of the fathers of the nation Israel, he said, they said, well, Moses allowed it. Um, just give your wife a certificate of divorce and she was on his way, her way out the door. But Jesus said, Moses gave those instructions only because of the hardness of your heart. Only because he knew how stubborn and rebellious you were. The this has never, ever been God's intention. It was a concession to the hardness of man's heart. And, and watch out for hard heart saints. It's, it's easy to sit before the word and develop a heart 
that's resistant, that's saying no and is rebelling. As they came to Jesus wanting to talk about divorce, Jesus wanted to talk to them about marriage. Why, what did God intend from the beginning? And this is what we always need to go. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's see how, how God set this thing up initially. And in the beginning, the Bible says that God made them male and female. And we need to let that sink in because we've got a culture that wants to make marriage uh, uh, beyond male and female. We are living in a culture. We are living in a time. We are almost at a place for me to stand and say to you that marriage is only to be between a male and female could put me at some risk. This same pastor friend that I was telling you about in Pasadena, who said that half his congregation would be gone, he preached about marriage being between male and female. The very next Sunday, hundreds showed up and they were picketing the church. He had to leave the meeting that we were at and go back because of the disturbance that his message had brought to the community. There's probably going to be a time, and it may not be very far off, where to stand before people and to say that marriage is between a male, a man, and a woman is to be accused of hate speech. That's the way our culture is headed. That, that's the way we are moving. God and the culture do not agree. And, and the church m many times and most of the time is always going to be counterculture. A church right here in this area within a half mile or so very recently followed, fired their pastor. They brought in a gay lesbian to lead the church. I was asking another person on the track where I walk, I said, well, they were talking about their church, and I said, well, well, is your pastor married? They said, well, no, oh, we don't know. Now, that's a problem right there, amen? We don't, we don't know. All we know is that all the, every time we see him, there's a man with him. He, there's a man always following him around. Well, something ain't right, amen? We can do, we can, we, in our human perspective, we can do whatever we feel that we are big enough to do. But don't think that God is going to ordain it, bless it, recognize it, because from the beginning, the creator God, he made them male and female. And it's always wrong to pervert and corrupt the will of God. Always. Now, for some of you who are struggling, we ought to love everybody. We ought to respect everybody. We ought to honor everybody. But we also, at the end of the day, with all the love that we have in our heart, you know, the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. I don't think it's appropriate for me to get up here and to rant and rave about this, and I don't think that's appropriate. I really don't. But I think I would be standing under the judgment of God if I fail to tell you the truth of God. And the truth of God is very, very clear here. God made them male and female, and gay marriage is never God's will. Now, hold on, tighten your seatbelt. Obama may endorse it. Biden may endorse it. Kamala Harris may endorse it. And politicians endorse it right and left. And I respect my black politicians. But this is one place I have to get off the train. Amen. Amen. 
I'm really being transparent this morning. I have never given any money to any politician or political candidate until Obama ran for president. Never gave anybody any money. When Obama ran for president, I wrote some checks. But when Obama endorses, when he says to me that I had this revelation that um, people ought to be able to love who they want to love, mm -hmm. and therefore gay marriage is okay, I had to step back. I prayed for Obama, but I didn't send him any more money. Yeah. And I wanted him to win the election. But that was just going to be a point where, as I say, that, you know, you, uh, what is it you, you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones? Yeah. I had to eat the meat and spit out the bones. I had to get off the train. Because my life is governed by something higher than Obama. As much as I respect Obama, Mrs. Obama, appreciate the family and all that, but I've got to go by God's word. The Bible says here that when a man marries, he's to leave mother and father. So it means uh, to those of us who are married that once we are take so-and-so as our wife, Mrs. Whoever she might be, mama is no longer to be number one. Now, love mama, respect mama, take care of mama, but your first obligation is to your wife. A man is to leave father and mother, and his wife is to, do, to be his new pri priority, and in marriage, they are to come together as one flesh. So the, the, the Pharisees came, they wanted to talk about divorce, but Jesus wanted to talk about what it is that marriage is all about. Jesus wanted to talk about unity. Jesus wanted to talk about oneness. He wanted them to understand that we are to have one man, one woman, one marriage until, we, until death separates them. Now, there, yeah, there is one, one very clear reason for a divorce. And I don't want to spend, don't want to get sidetracked. The Bible does say that if a person commits immorality, if I step out, that gives me the permission to get a divorce, but I don't have to get a divorce. If we can repent sincerely, and if we can be reconciled, that's better. But if I am a serial, if there is a continual pattern or if we just cannot be reconciled, those are some grounds for a divorce. In a marriage, there is but one, and someone wisely said that in a good marriage, what you have is two funerals and one resurrection. You die to yourself, and then you come up as one. You are to be one. And we have this clinch by, again, the word of God, where he says, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. This is the truth that we really need to stand on hold to. God expects this union. God intended for this union to be a permanent union until death separates us. Now, when that one dies, you're free to pursue. Paul said, you can marry again. He said, as long as you marry someone in the faith. Now, and remember, in the faith does not mean in this church. In the faith means somebody who knows the Lord. This is the word. This is the creator. This is what creator God said. The disciples came to Jesus, and they were a little befuddled. You mean to tell us there's no way out except death and immorality? And so this is where Jesus takes us to another level. He says, if a man divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery against her because these, he's abandoned his vows. And if a woman divorces her husband, now it was unheard of in that time for a woman to divorce her husband, but the Lord is raising the status of women here and putting them on equal footing with men and saying that if the man does this, 
He causes his wife to commit adultery. And if the woman divorces her husband and, then, and remarries, then she commits adultery. Well, the disciples say, oh my goodness, this is better not to marry. <laughs> This, this, is, this is some tough, tough going here. <laughs> Probably some of you have said, better than me not to come to church today. I didn't need to hear all this. Well, most of us, truth be told, we want to be married. And the Bible seems to give the indication that that is God's will for most of us to be married because we would be struggling without a mate, a spouse. Life seems to be a more enjoyable trip if you have a spouse, someone to share it with us, sh share it with. There are not many of us who are called to celibacy and singleness because if you're not married, you're not supposed to be out sowing seed all over everywhere. Amen. I'm just trying to give you some word this morning. We need to understand that if we are in a marriage, God has intended for that to be a permanent commitment, a permanent relationship. I said a few moments ago, if there's immorality, that gives you ground. Paul also seems to say that if there is desertion, that could give you grounds to remarry. Now, even though these words are, are, are tough in, our, in the culture in which we live, and, and you, you know, you're not gonna see this in the LA Times, we still know that when it comes to grace, mercy, and forgiveness, there was a woman who was taken in the very act of adultery. And she was brought to Jesus. And those who brought her to Jesus were waiting for Jesus to say, take her and stone her. Put her to death. But what did our Lord say to that woman taken, supposedly taken in the very act of adultery? He said to her, what? Go and sin no more. She found grace. She found forgiveness. She found mercy. And divorce should not be seen as an unpardonable sin. But we also have the responsibility, we cannot lower God's standard, but we also need to know that we serve a forgiving God. Amen. Amen. Well, suppose suppose I failed. Suppose I've already I've already failed. And is there any hope for me? Well, where are you? If you've wronged somebody, good possibility you need to go and make amends to your to your ex spouse, to those children. You need to confess that you were wrong if you are sincere and you're desire to serve the Lord. But the biggest thing that we need to hear beyond our repentance, beyond our confession, go forward from this day to do and to follow the greatest to the will of God, to be obedient to the will of our God. Our greatest need is not merit. Even though there are times when we are unmarried, we think that's our greatest need. Our greatest need is to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest need that we have. Then we look to him to say, Lord, lead me, guide me, direct me, take me by the hand. I don't know the way, but God has a word for my life, for your life in every area of our lives. Sometimes we think that church stuff is only good within these four walls. But no, God wants to speak to you about those very personal, very intimate issues of life and give you the direction, give you the instruction so that you really can have the very best life possible. To Jesus.
we're going to sing, uh, there's going to be a hymn of invitation play, played this morning. And as we open the altar for prayer, there may be someone who wants to come forward for prayer. There may be some need that you wish to bring before the Lord in your life. Perhaps you're hearing some of this for the very first time. And you're saying, Lord, what do, what do I do? Where am I, Lord? What word would you want to speak to my heart? All I would say is to you, don't have a hard heart. Don't say that my mind is made up. I want to be open to what God has to say to me. Let's stand and we, as we open this altar and call this morning and invite those who desire to come forward for prayer. If you'll come, if there's a need, we want you to come. We want you to know that the altar is open. Come to know Christ as Savior. Come because you want to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, that his word may be the final authority in your life. Perhaps you are in a relationship and it's a little difficult going right now. It'd be a good time to come and say, Lord, I understand what it's supposed to be. Give me grace to walk it out. Give me grace to be what I need to be so that this marriage can be what it ought to be. Amen. All those who desire, we want you to feel welcome at the altar, just a place of point of prayer, a point of prayer. We've heard your word this morning, and we know that your word runs counterculture to our culture. And so we come this morning, we come, we stand, we kneel before this altar, bringing to you our families, our marriages, our wife, our spouse, Lord. We bring to you our homes and say, Lord, give us grace that we can build them on the word of the living God. Help us, oh God, to seek after you with all of our hearts. Help us to embrace this truth, Lord, and begin to work it out in the marriage that you have us a part of. Bless, O oh God, those who come to the altar for many other reasons today. They may have come because of health and physical needs. They may have come because of other family needs, children, grandchildren. They may have come, O oh God, because of something else that's personal and very private. We are grateful that we can cast every care upon you because we know that you care for us. You choose to love us with an everlasting love. And so, Lord, we just invite you to empower us by your spirit to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. We are going to um, transition into our communion service. If you'll give the deacons just a moment to... Um, make this transition and then we will serve the uh, communion. God bless you. Yes.
houses and cars. Some would rather have a new outfit, but I will cherish the old rugged is an open communion to all of those who are born again, who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We invite you to this table of communion. As we come to the table of communion, we declare openly and publicly our faith, our relationship as members of the body of Christ. We will begin this morning with the reading of the uh, scripture by uh, Pastor Bertrand Wainick. Uh, the scripture is coming from Matthew chapter 26. Um, I'll go ahead and read 20 through uh, 30. It reads, when evening had come, he sat down with the 12. Now, as they were eating, he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, he who would dip his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my, my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let us pray. Lord God, as we gather at this table of communion, the Lord's Supper, we reflect upon the great sacrifice and price paid for our sins, the great price that was paid at Calvary as your body was broken, as your blood was shed. And we remind in your word that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And we are so thankful that you were willing to do what we could not do for ourselves you became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. We ask you now to examine our hearts, see if there is any un, 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 wicked way, any unclean way. And oh Lord, lead us in the way of life everlasting. Thank you in Jesus name, amen. <clears throat> Please join with me in the Apostles Creed. Uh, think of uh, please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Our deacons will serve you the communion. You're asked to take it and hold it as you receive it, and then we will commune together. Where I first saw 
Somebody open your mouth and worship the Lord tonight. Come on, let's finish strong. Open your mouth. The wafer represents the body of our Lord broken for us at Calvary. Please take and eat you all of it. And the cup is a symbol of his blood shed for us at Calvary. Drink ye all of it. If you hold on to the cup as you leave the auditorium sanctuary, there is uh, there will be a receptacle that you can deposit the uh, cup in. Uh, before we uh, leave this morning, let me also say the offerings, if you like brought an offering this morning, that is also at the rear, you can leave that. Um, we have a few acknowledgments to make this morning. This October is Clergy Appreciation Month, and uh, we also have some very special presentations to some folk who unfortunately are going to be leaving us, but the Kurt is going to okay, have a seat. No, no, yeah, let's have a seat. You can have a seat. Brother Kurt is going to uh, make a few presentations and we won't take long. Then um, I'll come back and say something about a couple of minutes. All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> on behalf of myself and the deacon board, I first want to thank my lovely wife, Marie, uh, for putting these packages together today. Um, she really uh, put a package of love together for our ministers. Um, you may know, uh, you may know or not know that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So we wanted to make sure that Minister Bertrand got on the road with his wife to get down here so that we could give him uh, something to show love toward him. Uh, 
And so uh, for today, you know, I, I think about what we've been through this uh, year and, and last year, and, and we really wanted to show our love for our ministers who they, they really uh, gave us the spiritual leadership we needed uh, during these turbulent times. And we really do appreciate each of you and hope you will enjoy our token of love and let the church give them a, a round of applause. And amen. amen. So if our ministers would come forward. Okay. Let's see, let me do this right now. Can I help everyone? <laughs> yeah. There we go, my brother. All right. And uh, Mr. Danny. Okay. And our, our bishop, our pastor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Curry. We appreciate that. For those of you, again, who don't know, this is National Appreciation, Clergy Appreciation Month. This is a national um, day of encouragement for those who are in ministry across the United States. And so many, many churches have begun to present special gifts or tokens just to say to their pastoral staff, Thank you, we appreciate the work you're doing. Now, what we're going to do now for just a few moments, if you bear with us, just a couple of more minutes, a few more minutes, we have some members who are leaving. They are relocating. Now, this we do not do with great joy. We, we really want to weep this morning over, over these persons who are, who are leaving us. But Robert and Prissy Jenkins are going to be re relocating to Brandon, Mississippi. It's, uh, sometimes a little later this fall, where is Prissy? Oh, Sister Prissy, I'd like for you to come forward and um, stand up here with me for just a moment or so, if you can. And we thank Marie again also for preparing these things also. And we also have uh, Sister Joyce Bingham who is coming. Uh, Sister Joyce, Again, we like to see people get married, but I tell you, we don't want you to leave us. And Joyce is getting married, and she's going to be going to Chicago uh, because um, supposed to leave mother, father, and go to that new spouse. <laughs> I wonder if we can get some exceptions on that. <laughs> Joyce, and then also to... Um, uh, to Donovan, Donovan, Donovan. This is, Donovan is like a part of our backbone over here. And, uh, we uh, get this to you. Yeah, come over by your husband, by your wife, Donovan. Donovan does not have his wife, Pam, because Pam works uh, and um, otherwise she would uh, be here. But these are three individuals who have meant so much to Christ Temple. They have been here, you all have been here for how many years? 40. They've been here 44 years. I guess uh, these other two have been here about as long as they've been born. So somewhere around around 30-some years. And to, um, to, to lose them and the gifts that they bring and the contributions that they make, uh, it's really, really hard. It's, they say it's really hard to say goodbye. Um, um, Lucy is doing openly what I feel like I'm doing in my heart. And uh, Prissy, and do any of you all want to have a word before we I, I want to ask a say a prayer over you all. So we, you all have word, and then you and Sister. Okay, you, you, go ahead, Prissy. You all go ahead. If you want to say a word. Well, uh, when I came to California, I didn't know this church we was going to end. 
but we came to Christ the temple and it was like it was made for us. Mm. And it's been a blessing for us to still be here for so right now. And uh, it's hard to be. Mm. And uh, I would just ask you that you change the first of that we will uh, the Lord first in our oh. life. Amen. Amen. Uh, of course, I've been here for 30 years. It's been a joy, but one thing I remember the most and appreciate when I was a little younger, you guys let me get involved in some of everything. Basically, as Joyce likes to say, it was one. And so I appreciate, you know, all the leadership like that you taught us, the things that I've learned personally that I can take on from somewhere else, and then just all of the support. I know that you guys know we live about 50 miles, and I was just talking to the waiters this morning. I was like, yeah, this car has a lot of miles on it, but all the traveling up and down the freeway has been worth it. It's been a joy. So. Amen. Amen. Thank you for all of your years at Christ Temple LA. I know they um gonna miss you. I know that because they told me when I was there, because they're upset that you're coming to Chicago with some young handsome fella. Don't know who he is. Uh, hopefully it's gonna be great, whoever you with. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say um one of the things that drew me closer to you um during our time of talking is just your passion for the church, your passion for the youth. And I saw that when you were working with the church. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm so glad I've been able to spend the rest of my life with you. But also, I know the church is going to miss you, but I know they love you. And yeah, I can't wait 
for you to be a part of the ministry at Christ Temple Chicago. So yes, uh, love you and enjoy the party. <laughs> personally thank Robert and Chrissy, Sam and Mary for bringing Donovan and Joyce into our lives. Mm -hmm. That I remember when Joyce first came with the little pony kid, uh, with it, and Donovan, I remember when he first came. But they could have picked any church to put these young people in. But they chose Christ Temple. Mm -hmm. And we thank you both. So let's give the parents. let's pray for let's just pray for a moment father god again we are so very very grateful for uh this couple brother and sister jenkins donovan and joyce we thank you for the great contribution that they've made here at christ temple we thank you for how you've worked in them and through them and now that as they prepare lord to leave this place we pray that they will always be faithful in their service to you we pray you go with for them and just protect them, keep them open every door that needs to be open, Lord, whether it's employment or whatever resources are needed. We're just trusting you to let your blessings, your mercies, your grace rest upon their lives. Make them a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we all stand? Again, the offerings there in the, the offering trays are in the rear. If you brought an offering for this morning, we are going to receive the benediction and uh, we'd like for you to leave, when I say um, without any congestion, that's the way you want to try to leave so that uh, we maintain our protocols. Um, Somebody else has already dismissed themselves. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit be with us all both now and forever. And God's people said, amen and amen. Amen. Good job for So Bertrand. Hayes, bless you, Brother Hayes. Anthony. Yeah.